Uh, I would like to uh, thank Katrin Klingan uh, and the terrific team that put this all together. Um, I'm probably the least suited to be talking about the Anthropocene because, of, as I told Bernard, um, I told him that I'm very wary about new concepts. And so I usually want to start them, uh, approaching them from a very cautious uh, non-register, if you want. I come from a department where quite a number of scholars uh, have written about uh, against technological determinism. Uh, many of them don't need introduction. Um, Leo Marx, uh, Rose Smith, Rosalind Williams. Uh, some of these scholars had a lot to do with the uh, edited book, Does Technology Drive History? Leo Marx is also the author of an influential essay, Technology, the Emergence of a Hazardous Concept. And I often read that uh, piece alongside uh, Benoit Godin's equally seminal intervention, Innovation, the History of a Category. Both Godin and Marx have inspired me to ask the question, what do, what do science, technology, and innovation mean from Africa? And I've just finished uh, editing a volume based out of a conference I hosted at MIT on the very same topic. I don't just mean things from outside Africa in African hands when I pose that question, but rather how Africans have defined means and ways to, to ends since time immemorial. I began to think of means and ways outside the Western episteme. Among people and modes of thought not represented here. I don't take being human and human being for granted. Slavery, colonialism, and racism show that humans and the idea of the human is never a given. One can slip from being a human being to a vermin being depending on relations of power. Sisu the lion can be more important than Trayvon Martin. Where some take selfies with the eye or smartphone, it's my only defense against the racist police. Trayvon's murder cautions against the technosphere evacuated of politics and the possibility of bigotry. Imagine a kid walking down the pavement who ends up dead at the end of a bullet and the neighborhood watchman who guns him down is exonerated because Trayvon Martin was, after all, armed with the pavement. Technocentric commentary is fascinated about how mobile technology is changing Africa. Meanwhile, it misses another perspective, how Africans are changing mobile technology and its applications. To most Western observers, the headline is not anthropocentric or Afrocentric, but technocentric, how gadgets are changing people. The pullout from the mobile African market of the giant orange, the corporation orange, from Uganda and Kenya in particular, shows how African companies and African capitalists are outcompeting and driving out the big Western-based and Chinese-based multinational corporations. 
African-owned companies are winning big tenders outside Africa itself. After the Wall Street crash of 2008, Portugal, the leaders of Portugal traveled to Luanda, Angola, to beg for money from their former colony. Of course, you can say Portugal is in the habit of doing this. For a very long time, it relied on its former colony, Brazil. And President Jose Eduardo dos Santos' reply was very interesting. He said, we would be very interested in, in investing in Portugal and to send a delegation to come and explore investment opportunities. I say this to caution against depositing the concept of the technosphere simply in Western logics. Let's float it and see the multiple particulates that come to constitute it. Humble to the fact that Western scientific rationality is only one ingredient, not the only explanation. After all, as Walter Mignolo cautions, Western modernity is just a mere 400 years plus. And it happened, that modernity happened because not absent of colonialism and the enslavement and decolonization of others. In this presentation, I omit Africa's long history with scientific thought and technological practice based on and intended to fulfill spiritual ends whose traces go as far back as ancient Egypt, at the very least over 5,000 years ago. I will also omit the resilience and persistence of endogenous knowledge in the colonial period for reasons of time. I want instead to use a historical detour to explain the salience and behavior of mobile technology in African hands today via earlier African behavior towards another Africa Af artifact of Chinese origin that arrived in Africa via Europe, the gun. Case study Zimbabwe. The starting point, the colonization of the lands that you see on the map that lie between the Limpopo River and the Zambezi in Southern Africa by the Chartered Corporation, the British South Africa Company, or BSAC, and its repartition into the colony called Southern Rhodesia between 1890 and 1893. The personal ambitions of its chair and prime mover, Sisu John Rhodes, to create a British empire spanning the entire continent are represented rather nicely in this 1892 cartoon. Now, this is the cleaner view of capitalism and global domination as clean as a whistle and victimless. The reality is very different. Rhodes' imperial dream was achieved through violence. After the initial settlement, the local inhabitants rose in rebellion in 1896-7, which is often called Chimrenga, or the War of Liberation. Now, it's half the reality that Africans lost because of technological inferiority. They had been importing firearms for over a century and integrating them into their endogenous security architectures. They fused them into guerrilla warfare, specifically the use of mountains as defensive and offensive infrastructures, to the point of neutralizing the firepower of the Maxim and the Nordenfeld guns, which had been such devastating beasts in the war of 1893. And that war was the war of the initial occupation. Things turned out very differently in the 1896-7 war because of the capability to utilize mountains as bunkers 
for reasons I will explain later, I defer the reasonings of that. Now, the British were forced to have to resort to, to divest from offensive to defensive warfare. The objective, to starve Africans into surrender. That is what ended the war. But note, for later reference, the meaning of technology and mountains as possibilities of thinking about technology. Anyway, the leaders were captured, many were beheaded, their heads sent to England to be shown to the Queen as evidence of capitulation. Even in captivity, in the same technologies or chains that bound Africans, uh, that bound Africans bound for the Americas centuries before, the defiance against tools of empire in these men's eyes is palpable. Shortly afterwards, these men who refused to be, they refused to be set apart and they stared their tormentor in the eye, these men would shortly afterward be executed. Importantly, the chief leaders of the war were spirit mediums, or Mashikiro. Not least, Nea and Anyakaskana, uh, that woman on the, on the left, Sekuru Kaguvi on the right, and Mukwati, who is in that picture to the left of Nea and the fate of Mkwati was unknown, is unknown. Kaguvi was convinced by the missionaries to convert to Christianity just before he, he was beheaded. Neander refused and steadfastly, it's a, it's a very important uh, 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 topic of gender uh, from a Zimbabwean perspective. Neander refused and said before she was beheaded, you may kill the flesh, but my bones will rise and crush you. Her head was shipped along with those of other Chimringa leaders to England uh, for reasons I have just shown. Today, in fact, up until a few months ago, they were displayed in the British Museum of Natural History. In the aftermath, Africans were violently removed from their land to make way for white mines and farms, and resettled in overcrowded, infertile, and disease-infested areas called native reserves, from which Europeans extracted them as forced labor. Using two instruments, the gun and arbitrary laws, the British set about making Africans what Anson Rabenberg called human mortars, producing raw materials to feed Europe's industrial revolution and development. Walter Rodney tells this story in a book entitled How Europe Deve Underdeveloped Africa. To ensure supply, the colonial government imposed a slew of taxes. The African would either come willingly to the white farmer, earn a wage and pay taxes, or as convict labor for failing to pay them. If that failed, just raid the village. The entire road, rail, urban, mine and agricultural infrastructure of the colonial period in Zimbabwe was built using poorly paid conscript and convict labor. This is how Africans subsidized colonial settler prosperity, became tools of empire, and built Europe. And here you can read a critique of Daniel Hedrick's notion of tools of empire. Now, earlier I said I don't take being human for granted. The marker of the subhuman condition of Africans in the colonizer's eyes is symbolized in the color bar, which designated access to everything according to the color of one's skin, which could mean that if you were black, you had poor or no quality. If you're white, you had high quality or simply quality. That is why I cautioned against thinking about notions of interdependence among those trying to use the term technosphere. By the 1930s, Africans were starting to go to school and getting 
quite educated. Here, the ways through which they summoned endogenous and incoming resources to negotiate their situation becomes very interesting. They went to school, acquired literacy in Western knowledge as a strategy to get tools that might enable them to access opportunities denied them because of skin color. Traveling abroad, they imbib imbibed Marx and Lenin, negritude, Pan-Africanism, and other idioms and consciousnesses. Inspired by Ghana's independence, they began to dream freedom beyond merely accessing opportunities. They asked why their bodies walked the, free, the unfree land, were imprisoned by its oppression, even as their minds had already declared independence. Hence, the whole notion of the name Zimbabwe begins to gain traction in the 1950s. I'm trying to say that Zimbabwe already existed in their minds and spirits before it was born formally in 1980. Back then, in the 60s, it just needed to be freed so that the body and mind might enjoy it together. And this is how they represented maps. Zimbabwe must be free. So it's a free country, but it has to be liberated. They established what Pada Chatterjee has called a spiritual domain of sovereignty even as their bodies lived in Rhodesia. Then they began to assemble and seek the means and design ways with which to realize it. One was the Nationalist Party with an army, and two emerged. One was the Zimbabwean African People's Union and its guerrilla army, Zipra. The other one was Zanla, the Zimbabwean African National Union, ZANU, and its army, Zanla. And so these were the means with which they could organize. But the organizing is not the same as fighting and reclaiming um, sovereignty. So guerrilla warfare became the means using one principal weapon, the gun. Hence the idea of the language of the gun barrel you begin to see a gun speaking. And the reason why the gun could be given a language was precisely because all other modes of negotiation had failed. So the only way to speak was through the gun barrel. At that stage, some of you may know Eric Honecker. Um, you will begin to have these leaders forging networks throughout the world, to seek means with which to realize their visions. It's happening at a time of the Cold War. And the Cold War becomes a resource that Africans mobilize to acquire means to turn their spiritual domains of sovereignty into independence. Zipra was armed, trained, and supplied by the Soviet Union, East Germany, and Cuba, and operated out of Zambia. Zanla was trained by China and Tanzania and operated out of Mozambique. These countries had their own motivations from the 1960s onwards for supporting these local actors. The moral of the story, two actors, one shared moment or temporality, one connection, the gun, but very different meanings. The capacity to turn spiritual yearning into physically felt freedom rested on attaining a capacity to match and exceed the colonial regime's instruments of domination. Interestingly, the same weapon of white settler self-preservation became the African's a weapon of self-liberation on the other. And to acquire that capacity required one to recuse oneself from the country of birth, to go outside in the world, just like they had done with going to read books, acquire weapons and means with which to come back and liberate the space within which the physical body walked. 
in other ways to harmonize the freedom not only of the mind, but also of the body. And there they are, coming back. This is how they depicted themselves. We have taken up arms. After mastering military tactics, the trained soldier was armed with guns, faced home, and headed to the rural countryside to fight for freedom, body and mind in lockstep. Pose. Here are Africans actively going out into the world to explore it for usable resources and bringing back home as ingredients and instruments to undertake their own self-liberation, things like this. We have already seen that. But we are going to see it even more so with mobile phones. A key aspect of this war was the unity of action between the guerrilla and the rural masses. Fewer images capture this symbiotic relationship between the gun, the guerrilla, and the cooking stick and grinding stick, the traditional food preparation equipment than this photograph. This is the crucial connection between locally generated idioms and incoming ones. It's an important metaphor for wider relations between the traditional and processing systems that anchored the gun, that provided the guerrilla with rations, with eyes and ears. The rural population also became the guerrilla surveillance system, a monitoring device, if you want, taking what we think of technology and infrastructure beyond the realm of human-made artifacts towards strategic deployments of and within the environment and its elements, human, mountains, forests, depressions, and beyond. Strategic deployments because, after all, technology, infrastructure, is not always an outcome of human modification, but precisely positioning ourselves within the environment without altering or destroying, but preserving and rendering sacred that which it contains. Indeed, these mountains were deemed sacred. The ancestral spirits were the custodians of the war, whose spiritual blessing and protection imbued in the guerrilla a sense of being near and as bones risen again. After all, she had said, my bones shall rise again. And this strategic deployment within and spiritualization of the environment put the Rhodesian government on the defensive, leading it to impose curfews, concentration camps, patrols, and landmines to dehumanize itself further by being barbaric. And here you see a map of how Zimbabwe was, Rhodesia then, was reorganized into a military uh, landscape. And it's this idea that we seek to preserve freedoms by building a prison of controls around ourselves. The use of severe forms of torture, electrocution, falanga, if you know falanga, it's foot whipping, sometimes with a, uh, something that has got nails to it, with the sharp, sharp ends uh, driven straight through so that they hit you and you begin to bleed. Severe beating, cutting off of the limbs, and the burning of villages, the establishment of concentration camps, disappearances, etc., had the effect of driving people into refugee camps outside the country, like Victory Camp in Zambia. There, hunger, diseases like malaria and diarrhea, malnutrition and insects like jigger fleas, if you Google jigger you will not go to sleep, so I won't tell you what it does. It's scary stuff. All these stalked people who went out of the country. To live like animals far from their land of birth was a matter of sacrifice for freedom. Freedom does not come cheaply. Enemy bombs and landmines severed limbs, biological weapons like cholera and anthrax, and chemical ones like napalm, organophosphates, and other deadly poisons were all unleashed. 
these deployments of technologies of massacre at Nyadzonia and Chimoyo in Mozambique and freedom and victory camps in Zambia in 1977 and 78 did not set the spiritual domain of sovereignty that I talked about or the fight to turn it into a realizable dream. They inspired Africans to fight to the death. Let's not underestimate, therefore, the power of the human spirit. I'm almost done. Don't go to sleep. <laughs> to break the chains, to break the technologies of imprisonment, required not just innovation or technology, but a spirit of sacrifice, initiative, and resilience. That non-tangible, that non-material, that non-technological resource seldom features in the narrative of victimhood about Africa. All we see are dead bodies, HIV AIDS. Diseases that are just crawling all over the place, hunger, poverty, refugees, you see this all the time. Here is how cartoonists for the Zimbabwe Review, uh, Zapu's mouthpiece, depicted this African spirit and its capacity to defy even the laws of physics. Flesh tearing away steel shackles, the colonizer's guns. It's what we won't see when we look only at technology's victims. It's what we won't see when we scale down technos technosphere to a specific hemisphere and a specific language and its idioms. And further still, to a specific region or country in the world. The undoing of the chains, the enchaining of the colonizer and defeating him by his own weapons was a combination of forces, means, and ways that exceeded and defeated technology in the way it's often understood. The actual force was not technology itself. Hence, there is no such thing as technology as an autonomous force. Unleashing a vertigo, a technological vertigo. It goes, takes us back to the argument about do guns people or do keep people kill people. Technology was a means, a platform, and it's still a means and a platform that people use to operationalize their dreams. It could be locally generated, like the grinding stone, imported, like the AK-47, or something people neither make nor modify, like mountains. The problem, I think, with Western technological narratives is that they are too secular. It's impossible to account for this war that I have just talked about and the deployment of guns absent of the spiritual whose blessings the fighters themselves could not go into combat without. The psychology would not be right. Without Western technological narratives, uh, while, while Western technological narratives reduce technology to gadgetry, Chimrenga can be seen as something that mobilizes not just the spirits, but also the sacred sites and atmospheres, the mountains, the caves, the forests, the shimmering pools, darkness, even rain and fog, into resources for struggling for self-liberation. None of them were the kind of natural that we often talk about in STS and animal studies. They mobilized unity of spirit and mortal, or all Africa, or progressive forces into infrastructures for self-liberation means of struggle. Technology ceases to be so simple or enough. Spheric thinking, better yet technospheric thinking, will have to reckon with these complexities which are rooted not in the 20th century or the last 100 years, but have emerged over hundreds and hundreds of years. 
Let me end with this. Sometimes hegemonic narratives exaggerate the uniform, universal, and overwhelming power of new artifacts, new technologies. Relax. We Africans have been through a lot. We have learned how to relax in the midst of it all. These narratives exaggerate the pervasiveness of such objects, salience, to be technology to everyone depositing in objects the power to configure their users, to shape, and even run their world. The Zimbabwean just, story just told, and we are coming from another one, where inflation was a billion something percent. Worse, far worse than the German inflation uh, after the First World War. And we are still alive. So the Zimbabwean story witnesses to another narrative, that the forces of new technologies are not as untamable as they are often said to be. Claims to the newness of phenomenon is often, sometimes, ahistorical. I look at how, throughout Africa, people are changing the way mobile technology works, are redefining what mobile means, and are reassigning these incoming gizmos, new values. I see how the latest things from this part of the world are imported and deployed as only the latest platforms, means, and ways to stage specific projects and dreams of self-desired modernities. I look at prior incoming things, Indian cloth, Chinese porcelain and beads, books and Bibles, guns and gunpowder, and I am unable to say that Africans have responded any differently to mobile phone and internet technologies. Hence this picture. One of the most interesting features of pre-colonial Shona people of Zimbabwe was to build their homesteads on hilltops and to fight their enemies from the rocks. It was a common place practice for chiefs or kings to settle their most trusted vassals or cowards on strategic hilltop settlements and likely enemy approach routes to act as sentinels. Each hilltop settlement was not just on intervisible or mutually visible hills, and the use of smoke during the day and bonfire at night enabled not only communication, enabled communication, but also sordid sound in times of war. Whichever the mode of signal one used, it had to have a clear sign of sight, line of sight between the next itself and the next hill. Even if the next hill beyond was in the shadow or was not visible to the first one. At the sighting of the enemy, the sentinel immediately blew his kudu horn trumpet, alerting the one al uh, uh, located on the next hill, who blew his uh, own uh, horn to alert the one on the hill beyond, until entire communities got the message. And the guerrillas in the 1970s used the exact same methods. I was one of the signals. We used to be told to go and climb the the tallest hill and the tallest tree and the tallest ant hills. In 1978, I almost got shot with my young brother just after we had been told to go to a hill and indicate to the guerrillas that soldiers were coming from the other side. I was communication equipment to guerrillas. So what do we say about that in our narratives? Today is the exact same thing. When you don't have a signal in Africa, don't worry. Just climb the tallest thing in sight, and voila, you have high fives. Thank you. <laughs>